Galatians chapter 5. Let me ask you a question this morning. We read this. Galatians 5 verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So I'm going to ask you a question here. Um, try to remember where we left off last week. What is the difference between a dead church and a church that's alive? Okay? Uh, because certain churches would accuse others of being dead. Because our music is not fast enough, doesn't have enough beat to it, people aren't dancing. Now, I've been to Kenya, and they don't like to stand still when they sing. Ain't a thing wrong with it. And when we were in uh, Kilimambogo, which is uh, east of Nairobi, those people were so beautiful, so godly. I, I tell you what, it's such a sweet spirit there. But boy, they were just, they turn around. And then me and my cuts will stand in there like secret service agents. Okay? <laughs> like we were on guard duty or something. It, you know, it's just, but it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, if you had two chickens and you cut the head off of one of those chickens, what's that chicken going to do? He's going to dance for a while. And then what? He's going to fall. The difference between a dead church and a live church is the one that's still standing. It's the one that's still standing. And you contemplate that, okay? This is, when Paul said this, stand fast in the liberty, it was timely, it spoke of the time that they were in at that moment because Paul was dealing with the Jewish roots moving in to those churches, telling those people that if they didn't get circumcised and they didn't follow the law, that they weren't saved. So it was timely for them at that time that they needed to hear, stand fast in the liberty. Don't fall for that stuff. If you're a Jew, you're a Jew. But if you're a Gentile, you're a Gentile. God did not demand the Gentiles go and live and act the way the Jews do. That was, that was one of the things that came out of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. So he told them, stand fast in the liberty. The second part of that is, it's timely for us now. We're facing, in this country, this is, going to be a, this is going to be a rough year. It is going to be a rough, rough year. Because there is, there is a, a growing movement to take away the liberties that we have in this country. And I don't know what it's going to come to. And I'm going to be honest with you, part of that worries me. Part of that worries me. Sometimes when I am not doing well emotionally, that stuff runs through my mind. And that's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, just take care of today. So you have to get in the Word, that's part of it, and I'll get into that a little bit later on, okay? But I am fearful for what is coming to this nation, okay? Because it, it's not going to be good, no matter what but some people are going to have to stand fast and not move away and not be moved away, all right? But it's also prophetic. There is coming a falling away, and Paul said that was coming first. You got to believe what the Bible says. That's coming first. And I think there is coming a time when it's going to be known who is and who ain't, as far as who belongs to God and who doesn't. Those who belong to God, God's going to strengthen our feeble knees. None of us, none of us, I'm telling you, none of us have the ability in and of our, the strength of our flesh 
to stand when we're full of fear. None of us do. Okay? God has to strengthen our feeble knees and cause us to stand. He has to put it in our hearts to stand. And I believe with all of my being that God will in fact do that. All right? Uh, let's go to Psalm 5. Psalm 5. <clears throat> We're looking at things that fall, and then we'll look at things that stand, all right, as part of this. There's a lot here, so it's going to take a while to go through this, but I think it's worthy of it. There's a lot of meat on this chicken bone, all right? Psalm 5, verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their mouth is not full of faithfulness. They do not proclaim faith in the word of God. Their inward part is very wickedness. That means they're rotten. They can look good on the outside, be rotten on the inside. Okay? A deer. Lindsay wanted to stop one day and pick up a roadkill. It looked fresh, okay? So I stopped with her and was going to help her, but we kind of kicked around at it, and I said, Lindsay, I think this one's too far gone, okay? It still looks good on the outside, but where's the rottenness at? It's on the inside. Mm, don't trust that. That's what that's talking, their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. I want you to think about that. It's full, it's full of death. That's why your breath stinks in the morning. Uh, and all of us are like that. All of us are rotten on the inside. That's why our breath stinks. Everything that our body emits stinks. It smells. We are corruption machines. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. And let me, since I mentioned that gal at the Bernie Sanders deal the other day, okay? It, what surprises me, and probably it shouldn't surprise me, because we have filled young people's minds so full of socialism in the last 20, 30, 40 years that that's the corruption that we're, we're producing our own internal downfall in this nation because here's this young gal who at a bernie sanders event wants him to become president because she don't want to pay it pay, pay back a quarter of a million dollars in student loan debt for a degree that she will never be able to get work with never come on in ed okay she'll never be able to if she ever gets a job with this degree it'll just it'll just amaze me it's not the country's fault that she decided to study something stupid that would never feed her but she wants a man to be president who will promise that he's going to take everybody's hard-earned labor and pay her pay off her quarter of a million dollar student loan and not just hers but everybody else's now socialism works for the first five years. And then, who, who, who then, since, since all these people are on the government handout, getting all this money, who are they going to tax after a while when everybody figures out, why should I work when nobody else does? It's been tried. And it's been tried in Venezuela. Venezuela is a mess. Because of socialism. Cuba is a mess because of socialism. The Soviet Union fell because the name is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And back in the 50s, if you were a, an admitted socialist in this country, you got into a lot of trouble. That was a, that was a big no-no. They went fiercely. Ronald Reagan's whole thing was he hated socialism, he hated communism, and he stood up against the Soviet Union and beat them. Stood up stick strong against them. Now we've elected politicians that are as socialist as Chairman Mao was and want that for our country. And so what that means is, destroy them, O oh God, let them fall by their own counsels. That is exactly what's coming to this country. 
we will fall by our own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. We're going to fall because of our sins too. For they have rebelled against thee. That's what's causing people to fall. It's what's causing churches to fall, pastors to fall, church members, church leaders to fall. It's what's causing whole denominations to fall. It's what's causing the fall of, of what was the highest standard of living in the world is this country. If you don't believe it, just step across the border into Mexico. Just step across, take a look, and come back. Don't go too far. There was a town we used to go to on vacation. We used to take our kids to Matamoros, Mexico, which is just on the other side of Brownsville, Texas. My dad took us when we were little, and I took our kids down there several times, and we enjoyed it. Last time my wife and I went, we found out that's not the place to go to anymore. The cartels just drive by and shoot people. They'll just, they, they run that town now. And so the markets that they used to have, they used to do a lot of commerce there. Most of them were closed up. Just had a few shopkeepers left because the cartels run them off. Okay? So that's what happens in other places, and it's coming here. Okay? We need revival in our country. Amen? If we're going to remain standing, we need revival. Uh, now turn to Psalm 20. Psalm 20 and Psalm 82, I put these two together. I'm going to get a little weird on you. You should be used to it by now. Some of you are here because I'm a little weird. Oh my goodness, stop it. Yeah, I'm figuring it out. All right, Psalm 20, verse 7. Now before I read this, let me, let me explain some things. God rides in a chariot. Did you know that? The book of Psalms says the chariots of the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Okay? What was it that was sent down from heaven to divide Elijah from Elisha? A chariot, a fire, which was an, it, it was an angelic being. What did Ezekiel see in Ezekiel chapter 1? It was, a, it was God's chariot because it, had, it was four angels, four cherubs, with a, a firmament, a crystal firmament, and God's throne on it, and it had wheels, and they were alive. The whole thing was a living creature. I know it's a little weird, but that, the whole thing in Ezekiel was a living creature because the spirit of the living beings, the beasts, the angels, was in those wheels. And it was in every part of that chariot, okay? So the whole thing was like it was alive. So now, why ask me why God rides in a chariot? Don't, I have no idea, okay? I have no idea. But picture old times when kings never touched the ground, when they went through town. They had four guys or a group of guys carrying this big throne with the king or a prince or some ruler around in it because they were too good to touch the ground and to be whatever. Even in, even in Europe, in old Europe, the word sedan, you know what a sedan is, right? It's a car. But that word came from what these pompous dukes and princes and kings rode around in they, it, was, it was called a sedan. It would be, they would have servants holding them on their shoulders while the king or whoever sat inside this sedan. That's what it was called. Okay? It was their moving, living chariot. So the picture that we have from Ezekiel, from the book of Psalms, from the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was, was to never touch the ground. It was carried by four Levite priests. The Ark of the Covenant was God's throne. It was God's living presence among the people. And the four Levite priests that carried the Ark was a picture of the four cherubs in Ezekiel chapter 1. Now I'm explaining this for a reason. Look in Psalm 20 verse 7. Some trust in chariots. Now, what in the world does that have to do with us today? I mean, how, who has, what army has chariots drawn by horses anymore? Okay. 
but it's still applicable. There are armies that are going to invade this world that are described as being armies in horses and chariots with bows and lances and arrows. Now, suppose, oh, I don't know, suppose Uganda wanted to go to war with the United States of America and they sent a boatload of horses and chariots and guys with bows and arrows to invade our country. How, how long would they last? They'd never even make it off the boats, right? Okay. That Bible's still right, people. That Bible's still right. We're not describing an earthly army. We're describing a heavenly one, an angelic one, an evil angel. Remember the shield of faith that we're supposed to have? What is it supposed to defend us against? Fiery darts of who? Satan's fiery darts. You think he uses a piece of titanium and a... No. He's got something far worse than that that flesh and blood cannot defend against. It takes a shield of faith. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal. So when you see this in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, don't think... Well, you can. You can think of that in two ways. If we were to apply that to... Let's say our nation. If our nation were to build up the greatest army with the biggest armament, biggest tanks, biggest bombs, this and that and the other, but we didn't have God on our side, we wouldn't win nothing. So read that verse in context. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and what? Fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Now, let's think spiritual for a minute. Remember the day when Elisha and his servant, I think it was Gehazi, and Gehazi got freaked out because the armies had surrounded him and Gehazi was going, oh my goodness, there's more of them than there is us and we're going to die and we're all going to be killed. And, and Elisha said, Gehazi, there, I promise you, there'll be more for us than there are for them. And Gehazi said, what are you, crazy? And he said, Lord, open his eyes. And he saw on every hill, every mountain, chariots and horses of fire. What were those? Angels angels okay so look at that verse again some trust in chariots and some in horses and i'm telling you there are groups and religious ideas in this world that are wanting the gods to come back down to this earth to rule over this earth and i could say it in various terms i could say hinduism i could say islam I could say uh, Satanism, I could say witchcraft, I could use the phrase UFOs, and I'm talking about the exact same thing in each and every one. Each and every one, okay? So notice that, understand that there are people right now in all over the world who want these angels to come down from heaven and take over this world so they can rule with them. Okay? That's going to happen. We know in Revelation 12, God's going to kick a third of the angels out of heaven. They're going to come down to the earth. What do you think those angels look like? They have different appearances. Some of them look like horses and chariots according to scripture and they're going to fall but what's going to happen to us we are risen and stand upright now look at psalm 82 okay and and in your bible make a note on psalm 20 write psalm 82 and in psalm 82 write psalm 20 because they're connected together make notes study this again study it out for yourself Okay, I'll give you a minute to write. <clears throat> Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said ye are gods. Gods, with a little g in the Bible, always refer to the angelic realm, either good or bad. Because technically, that's what they are. They're, they're, 
God made us humans lower than the angels, but the angels themselves, all of them, are lower than God. Okay? So we're like on the bottom here. But what's going to happen? God's going to raise us up, and we're going to judge angels at the end. He's going to raise us up above what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Okay? But then the Bible says that we're, know ye not that ye shall judge angels? So he's going to raise us up above them. So he said, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But, and gods are immortal. Angels don't die. They don't die. They can get cast into the pit. They're going to get cast into the lake of fire. Unless they do something they shouldn't do. Look at verse 7. But ye shall die like men. And fall like one of the princes. You know what princes are in the Bible? Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay? So even a certain portion of the angelic realm, um, how much is a third in percentage? Okay, you know Hindu, the Hindu religion, they worship multiple gods, right? You know how many? 330 million. The exact number. That's the third of the angels. That's who they worship. And all their gods look like this. <laughs> right? If you, go, if you go to India and look at all their gods, they're all going... <laughs> They are a nation of fierce countenance that God talked about. Fierce countenance means they look like mean alligators. Don't ask me to do that again. And this is my day job. Okay? But all of those gods are going to fall down to this earth. God's going to kick them out. Michael's, there's going to be a war in heaven. And Michael is going to fight the devil, and the dragon's going to take a third of those angels, cast them down to the earth. That's in Revelation 12. That's in the book of Daniel. That's what's going to happen. God's going to shake the heavens. Remember what he said? He's going to shake the heavens. And when he does, stuff's going to fall out of it. Okay? Like when you shake, I don't know, like when you... Go, go to your car and just hit the, uh, the seat you sit in and see what comes flying out of it. Ugh. You think your car is clean? <laughs> All right. Now let me move on from there. Psalm 36. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Now... Let me ask you this question. Have you ever fallen? Yes. A just man falleth seven times and riseth back up again. It was by grace after you fell that God let you even get back up. Okay? That was grace. Because God could have left you down there, but he didn't. By his mercy, by his grace, by his pure love for you, he let you rise back up. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Did you see Oprah? Did you see that? There's a video came out of Oprah Winfrey on stage. You know, she believes in New Age gods. 
the God that's within all of us. All religions worship the same God. That's Oprah Winfrey. She was just talking the other day and just wham, hit the floor. <laughs> you go look it up. It's got to be on YouTube by now. And everybody's going, oh! She has a haughty spirit. Amen? She has a haughty spirit. So this Bible's right in everything. And this is why I'll say, and I'll say it for as long as I live, I would rather deal with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. I'd rather deal with having days of depression or suffering. I would rather deal with pain than to have to deal with pride. Because in my youth, I used to be very arrogant and had men take me aside at times and say, you have an arrogant spirit about you. My first year in Bible college, the dean of students took me aside because I was going to go on a trip during the summer and sing for the college with a, with a quartet. <clears throat> and the dean of students pulled me aside and said, I'm just meeting with all the guys that are going out because you're going to be on the road, you know, and traveling together, and you're like, likely to get on one another's nerves. And, and he said, you've kind of made a name for yourself that you kind of are arrogant. And I went, wow. So when we got on the trip, I asked the other guys, I said, did the dean of students talk to you guys before you? And he said, no. It was just me. So God began to deal with me. And after that, I kind of cooled down for a little while. And people started liking me. But then I got arrogant again in my youth. And I hated it. I hate, when I look back to those days, I hate them. So God always finds a way, if he loves you, to bring you down. Okay? So this, this is why sometimes you will suffer. This is why sometimes your card won't start or you can't find your keys or you have terrible, tragic things happen in your life. This is why. It is God's way of keeping us where we need to be. And I'd rather it be that way because I know what I have on the other side. I know what I have on the other side. And if we're not careful, we'll get, care, we'll get arrogant even over that, over the other sinners that we're supposed to be responding to in love, saying, hey, I'm just like you. But I've t let me tell you, I found the Savior. I found the one who's got the answers. Okay, That's how we're supposed to treat sinners. Uh, Isaiah 14, turn there. Isaiah 14, let's spend a little time there. You know, the King James Bible, <clears throat> the King James Bible is the only one in all of the English translations that are, that are out there is the only one who actually gets this name right, Lucifer. Do you know the Satan worshipers know who Lucifer is? They do. Okay? Anton LaVey, the first church of Satan, he knew who Lucifer was. And the King James Bible is the only English translation that uses the real name Lucifer. And the word Lucifer means light bearer. Now there's a double witness in your Bible to why that name is right. Lucifer, light bearer. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, when he's talking about um, the false apostles, he said, for even Satan himself is transformed into a what? Angel of light. That, that phrase, angel, is messenger of light, light bearer. It's a double witness to how right this Bible is in naming him Lucifer. So look at what it says. How art thou, let's, in fact, let's, um, let's go back to verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. And we know this is true because we know where Satan's going to end up for a thousand years. He's going to end up in the pit. 
under, under everybody's feet. So it says in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So this is saying it as if it's already happened. And here's the interesting thing. Every time you see Satan in the Bible, he's always on his way down. In Genesis 3, God took his legs out from underneath him. So now he's crawling on his belly. He, he's even lower than cockroaches. Even cockroaches and ants, their belly don't drag the ground. They got legs. So he put them lower than even the roaches and the ants. Okay? Then you look here in Isaiah, he's falling. And then you look when Jesus said, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And then in Revelation 12, there he is falling again. And then in Revelation uh, 19, I think it is, he's, or 20, he's taken in chains and, and put into where? The bottomless pit. And he falls. And he keeps falling for a thousand years. Then after that, he's taken and thrown into the lake of fire. He's always on his way down. But his goal, How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars of God are the angels. And you look in Revelation 12, that's who he's fighting. He starts a war because he's trying to conquer the angelic realm. He wants to rule over all the angels. At one time, he's referred to in Ezekiel as the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay? And there was none in heaven as beautiful as he was. Because of that pride, because of that iniquity that was found in him, he was cast out. So he says... Um, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I'm uh, putting out a new Watchman broadcast today that uses this verse. And it shows you what the north is in the Bible. It'll tell you what the north is according to scripture. So watch for that to come out today. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then number five, I will, seven words here. I will be like who? The Most High. He didn't say he was going to be like Buddha. He already is. He didn't say he was going to be like uh, Muhammad. He didn't say he was going to be like um, any of the gods. He said he was going to be like the Most High. Ezekiel 28 says, he says, I, I, am, I am a God with a capital G. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's the throne of God, like you see in Ezekiel 1 in Revelation chapter 4. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And all of those are capital G's. So he's going to appear to this world to be the one true God transformed as an angel of light and every people people are going to believe it this i think is part of the strong delusion that everybody falls for this okay so i tell people acquaintance yourself with the real god get to know the real jesus knowing knowing Learn him. Learn what he'll say. Learn what he'll do. Learn what he thinks. What he looks like. Learn, 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 learn. So on that day, you're not fooled. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, 60 cubits wide. Remember that? I've talked about that last Sunday. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't fooled. They said, that's not our God. And we're not falling for it. Now, they would gladly bow before Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But they said, we're not bowing to that. That's not our God. So, um, I will be like the Most High, but look at verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. 
to the sides of the pit. That is exactly what's going to happen to him for 1,000 years. He's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. That's Revelation 20. And that's when Christ is going to be reigning on the earth for 1,000 years. No devil to, to deceive the nations any longer. Well, won't that be great? Whew, wow. That's beautiful. Uh, Isaiah 21, since you're in Isaiah, turn to Isaiah 21. Mm-mm-mm. Boy, there's, there's a lot in this Bible. When you start thinking about things that fall and things that rise, things that stand, Isaiah 21, 9. Uh, Behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. See, the gods are going to fall too in the day that Babylon falls. Ba people say, what is Babylon? Some say, it's, uh, some say it's this country. Some say it's Great Britain. Some say it is the Vatican. Babylon is everything that the kingdom of God isn't. It's, she is everywhere. Babylon could be in somebody sitting here, and we wouldn't know it until she starts manifesting. And she can manifest in a man or a woman. I've seen both. Anybody with a sort of a, a harlot spirit or a rebellious nature about them, okay, Con contrary to the Word of God, anybody like that, she hates authority, she hates the Word of God, she hates the men of God, the preaching of God. She hates, well, she hates all kinds of things. She's a drunkard. She's a fornicator. She loves when God's saints suffer and are slaughtered because she drinks their blood. Remember the day that Cain slew Abel? You know what the earth did? Opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. She drank it, and she holds a cup in Revelation 17 full of the blood of the martyrs, okay? So every time the blood of God's people was shed, that was her responsible for it. That was her that did it. Anytime, anytime the people of God are maligned or lied about, or mocked against, gossiped about. Anytime that happens, that's Babylon. And I'm telling you, anybody who is like that, they're going down. God promised it. They're going down. Jericho thought that it could withstand the onslaught of the Israeli army because of their wall. And all God had to do was sound the trumpet seven times and that wall came tumbling down. And those people had put all of their defense in that wall and once that wall fell, the whole city fell. Okay? Uh, Jeremiah 25, turn there. I like to put these in order so you can just kind of scroll through your Bible in order. Jeremiah 25, verse 27 Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. God will cause a spirit of drunkenness. What happens to drunk people? Why do, why do cops have them walk a line? Because they know they're going to fall. They know they can't do it. And there is drunkenness by alcohol and or drugs. There is drunkenness by way of certain spirits that cause people to fall because they won't believe the scriptures. They won't believe what the Bible says. And they can live high and proud and everything else. But one of these days, God always brings them down. 
always. If God lets you fall and lets you get back up, when we pray, you tell him thank you. You tell him thank you. Amen? Father, thank you. I've fallen. And you've always raised me back up. Truly, your mercy endureth forever to those who love you. Those who love your word. And so, Father, on behalf and in praying along with these people who are praying right now, Lord, we all say to you, thank you. Because all of us have gone astray like sheep. All of us have. All of us have let our sin make us arrogant and pompous. And all of us have fallen. But you've justified us and cleansed us by your word and by the blood of Jesus. And you caused us to stand back up again. When they threw the woman down that had been caught in adultery and were going to cast stones upon her, Jesus said unto her, Go and sin no more. You allowed her to stand back up. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us in allowing us to stand. And Father, there is an evil day coming. An evil day that I'm not looking forward to. But it's coming nonetheless. And Father, my hope and my trust is that on that day, you will allow me to stand. You'll strengthen my feeble knees. And give me strength in my heart like that of a lion. And I'll stand on that day along with these fine people. Father, bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.